What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think in the comment section below. Also, to make sure you never miss another sit down show, make sure you hit that notification bell so you get notifiers whenever we go live or post a video. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, you're living on a rocket scene this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. In a few short months, it'll be 2023. As we delved into the 2020s, there was something we would find about the mobsters of old. They would start passing away. We've seen a lot of mob deaths over the last couple of years. Everybody from the likes of Peter Gotti to Neil Miglior to Mush Russo to Frank Lasterino. We also had another mob death last week. Tough Tony Federici. But what if I told you? Maybe he wasn't exactly a mobster after all. The story of Tony Federici next on Sit Down Shorts. Anthony Federici was born July 28th, 1940 in the Queen's Enclave of Corona. Now, back then, as we can see here on 52nd Avenue, the Lemonized King of Corona is made uh, aware. And back then, when Tony Federici was coming up, he would say that most of the residents in the neighborhood were from Calabria in southern Italy. He would talk about the fact that his parents were actually uh, farmers and that most of the people uh, from Corona were from the same areas that he was, um, rural Calabria. Now, for Tony Federici, there's not a ton known about his childhood, but we would find out several really interesting things about his childhood. In the teenage years, in the late 50s, and early 60s, Tony Federici's father, who at one point was a tailor, would actually open up a restaurant called the Corona Supper Club. Um, in that uh, little restaurant, he would say that was set, there were seven tables, and it was one of these mom and pop type of restaurants in Corona. It was a place for the people that were from Calabria and Corona Queens to come to have a meal that reminded them of the old country, whether it be, um, you know, whatever peasant food you would have, whether it's chicken parmesan or pasta fagiol or whatever. Um, he would say that that's where they could go to eat. It was a luncheon at dinner kind of spot. Uh, now, ultimately down the road, uh, when Tony Federici's parents would pass away, he would take upon the restaurant and rename it the present day Parkside restaurant in Corona. Now, as far as mob undertones, there weren't a ton in the early life of Anthony Federici. As a teenager, it was said that he loved pigeons and that he would have a, a pigeon coop. But he, according to himself, would uh, be made and told by his father that that's not something he should pursue. He didn't want to give off vibes to the other residents of Corona that his son was a farmer like the old country. His father was proud. He wanted to have the American dream and, in fact, didn't even teach his son Italian because he didn't want him to know the old country at all. He was a proud man, and Federucci, I'm sure, was quite proud of his father. And that's where he would learn the restaurant business. His father would teach him how to cook, and he would become a restaurateur in his own right. Now, according to the Federal government, because as I said at the beginning— it is very interesting because all the people that I've ever talked about on this channel or on my podcast, The Sit Down, all are involved with the mafia. And that's no different than today's subject. According to the government, Tony Federici is a reputed member of the Genovese crime family. In fact, some would tell you that he was a high-ranking member of the Genovese crime family. It's important, though, to realize that in the 82-year life of Tony Federici, there are very little, if any, actual proof that he was actually a mobster. Did he know mobsters? Absolutely. Was he seen in contact with mobsters? Absolutely. But other than that, there's very little proof of the fact. He was never arrested really for anything above uh, street level crimes as far as anything we would all be arrested for. There's no RICO on his rap sheet. There's no drug sales. There's no extortion. There's no gambling. But it's interesting. What I would learn about Tony Federici is that he was a very close confidant of Mickey Domino Generuso. Now, if you don't know who Mickey Domino Generuso is, I will probably do a video on him at some point. Mickey Domino goes all the way back to the Lucky Luciano, the Charlie Luciano years. That's how old and as long as he's been around the mafia. 
when he died, he was 97 years old. Um, but in his early years, he was the liaison between the Jewish associates to the Genovese crime family. That's the kind of guy he was. Now, Mickey Domino would ultimately become allegedly the underboss of the Genovese crime family in the late 90s and early 2000s under current alleged boss, Barney Malomo. Now, Mickey Domino was known to create careers for people, including Matty the Horse, Ein Yellow, and James the Little Guy, Ida. He was a very powerful individual, Mickey Domino, and Tough Tony allegedly learned some mafia chops from Mickey Domino. Now, according to the terrific website, lcnblogspot.com, they would say that in 1976, Tony Federici became a made member of the Genovese crime family. Keep in mind, that would make him 36 years old, quite young to get your button. Now, at that ceremony as well, was quiet Dom Cirillo, who would be initiated into the mafia as well as Joe Zito. Now, Joe Zito, as well as Dom Cirillo, would all take uh, the acting boss role at some point after the reign of Chin Giganti. Dom Cirillo was a close confidant of Chin Giganti, and Joe Zito was a very powerful individual for a long period of time. The thing, though, that Federici was doing was he was building his restaurant up. His parents by this point had passed away, and Federici was a regular working man. It was said that every day he would go to his restaurant, and from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m., he would serve the people of Corona, Queens, uh, very good meals. Uh, anyone that knows will tell you Parkside is a terrific restaurant, and they knew regardless of who Tony was, he might have been half a wise guy, but he was a great restaurateur and owned a great restaurant. It's funny because – what I know about Tony Federici, there are a lot of parallels with the character Artie Bucco from The Sopranos. If we remember in The Sopranos, Artie was a restaurant owner. He owned a restaurant that Tony and other members of the crew went to regularly, including even New York people like Johnny Sack and, 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 and other people. And I found a lot of parallels between him and Tony Federici. Now, as we know in The Sopranos, Artie Bucco was not a made member of the mafia, but he was still very connected, still did things um, that would liken what a mobster would do. Uh, there is also a very interesting story about Federici that I'll get into about shooting uh, hawks on the rooftop of his restaurant because they were bothering his pigeons, which is very much similar to in The Sopranos when Artie Bucco shot a rabbit in his garden uh, for messing with his uh, tomato plants, which is pretty interesting. So there are a lot of parallels between Artie Bucco and Tony Federici. What do you think about that? Uh, either way, Federici was making money, um, yet he was becoming a very well-known member of the Corona uh, world. Um, from what I understand, um, he would donate to many charities and was actually at one point honored by the Queen's um, borough president, Helen Marshall. In 2004, he would be honored for service to his community. In fact, many of the people in attendance were officers from the 110th precinct in Corona and Queens. Pretty interesting. Um, so he was a man that people knew. They liked. They enjoyed to be around. And if he was a gangster, they didn't really care. It was also said that he would continue his pigeon coop. He would put a pigeon coop on the top of the parks at restaurant. One of the things he said that was a great thing about the restaurant. And we would also find out some other things. He would start to associate with some pretty undesirable characters. In 1990, this individual, Anthony Tony Romanello, would allegedly become a made member of the Genovese crime family. Now, there are two things that connect to Tony Federici. According to the testimony of Genovese rat, Michael Cookie Dierso, he would say multiple times that Romanello was uh, given mentorship by Federici. In fact, Romanello's social club, the Corona Ave Social Club, was directly down the street from the Parkside restaurant. Now, if you know anything about present day Anthony Romanello throughout history, since he was made in the early 90s, he has been a gambling kingpin for the Genovese crime family. To this day, he's involved with gambling, loan sharking, and extortion. Now, I would get that information from the fact that he was arrested last year after he allegedly beat up a restaurateur owner in Manhattan for uh, not paying him. So he was very much involved. Now, Cookie D'Urso would say that the reason Romanello was made was to basically be a conduit 
between Anthony Federici and the upper echelon of the Genovese crime family. He could basically pass off that he was a restaurateur and Romanello would handle the uh, things that he was doing and kick up nice envelopes each week. And in turn, Romanello would secretly kick up to the Genovese crime family. I have no proof of that. Um, I'm just telling you what uh, mobsters do. And we would assume that Federici did that. But as I said, there's very little proof of any of this. We know who Romanello is. We know that he had a social club down the street. That doesn't mean that Federici was connected to him, though. It is a very interesting person to discuss. Federici is super interesting from the point of, do we actually buy into the fact that he was a gangster? Now, uh, there would also be um, several things that we would also find out about uh, Mr. Federici and his standing in the Genovese crime family. According to a wiretap conversation where the feds would pick up Thomas Cafaro on tape, and we know Thomas Cafaro from being the son of Vinny the Fish Cafaro. I did a video on him seen here. Um, he would describe Federici in a wiretap conversation as, quote, cagey, and that he could have been more in the family, but he elected not to be. So one thing we know about Federici is maybe he's just super elusive. He doesn't want to be a higher up individual because he doesn't want the le the fact that the feds will be all over him. He just wants to make money through his restaurant, take his money from Romanello and be uh, a very good cog in the Genovese wheel. It's pretty simple, right? Um, we would also hear more about Federici in uh, the early 2000s when Carmine the Bull Agnello was being investigated uh, by the federal government. As we know, uh, in 2000, around that time, Agnello would surface after it was allegedly firebombed uh, associates uh, from a scrap metal yard near his scrap metal yard in Queens. Now, one thing we know, both the locations we're talking about, Corona and where Carmine Agnello were, were in Queens. He knew Federici. In one conversation, um, it was alleged that Agnello and Federici were talking about the informant that allegedly uh, got Agnello jammed up or was getting him jammed up. At one point, Agnello would, according to an agent, testify that he showed Federici a photo of the informant and said that if the snitch was found, he should get the Italian horns, a reference in some circles to murder. So basically, Federici was saying that if he's a rat, he should be killed. Uh, now, Federici would say that this meeting never happened um, like a good gangster would. Um, but Agnello ultimately would go to prison for this little stunt. Um, but as we see here, the people and company that Federici is keeping uh, are gangsters in a way. Now, I do want to discuss um, some of the interviews that Federici did over the years. He would always try to contend that he was not a gangster. And in an uh, interview he did with uh, the popular uh, – website and social media content creation site vice he would be asked by the reporter in that case uh, jonathan turton a liverpool born freelance journalist who wrote on behalf of vice turton would ask uh, federici about his connections to the genovese crime family and he would say quote what about them they're a family i guess no who knows who comes in here i'm not screening people at the door or asking them for their itineraries so he would contest that he's just a restaurant tour owner and he can't limit people from coming in. They like his food. They're Southern Italian or from Sicily. They like the fare that he has. He was well known. He was already Buco. That's what he's basically trying to say. Now, another individual that would visit him regularly was said to be a close friend, Colombo crime family heavyweight, John Sonny Franzese. Uh, he would also be seen regularly in contact at the restaurant with his underling and protege, Guy Fatato. Now, at one point in the conversation uh, with Sonny Franzese, it was said that uh, Federici allegedly came up to the table and mentioned the recent arrest in 2005 of Bruno and Delicato. Um, now, we ask ourselves, why would a just restaurant tour owner care much about uh, Bruno and Delicato, but the feds would say that it was more than just mob gossip, that it rose to above that. Um, and that's basically what they're piecing together, that because he knows all these mobsters uh, and that he might be connected to uh, reputed gangsters on the street, that his restaurant is a front for uh, legal activity. Uh, now, Federici's uh, lawyers would also fire back at one point saying, uh, quote, it's remarkable that the government has nothing better to do than go after an old man for old gambling crimes simply because he refused to cooperate with an FBI supervisor who seems obsessed 
but turning tired old men into government rats. Now, that was the uh, attorney, Gerald McMahon, of Tony Romanello, who, as we know, is close uh, to Mr. Federici. Now, co-counsel Matthew Mari, who represented Federici in the past, said the Fed's allegations are way off. He's no criminal, said Mari. He does not commit crimes. He goes to work at 11 a.m. He's in the restaurant until 11 p.m. and then goes home. If the FBI actually follows him outside, all they will see him is picking up his garbage outside the restaurant. And that comes from ganglandnews.com. So the lawyers would contend he's not doing anything wrong here. Now, I do want to kind of begin to wrap this up, but I do want to discuss some of the very interesting um, arrests that Federici had. In 2000, he would actually be arrested for shooting at hawks who he claims were bothering his pigeons. We can't blame him for that. He would also in 2004 be arrested uh, after he was caught in Fresh Meadow uh, for uh, driving with a suspended license, no registration, and guns and brass knuckles in his car. Now, we can equate that to just he didn't keep up with his motor vehicle report uh, and or he forgot that he had a gun in the car. Who knows? Again, a crime that all of us can be caught up for. It's not one of those typical mob crimes, extortion or loan sharking or something like that. That is bereft on this record. There's none of that here. Uh, Tony Federici in his entire 82-year life never spent a minute in prison, and he was never actually caught on anything mob-related. Um, the truth is he just knew a ton of mobsters. Now, this is a very interesting photo. Seen here, uh, you see a woman in red. Directly underneath her is Anthony Federici. Directly to Federici's left is Mickey Domino Generuso. We have to ask ourselves, why is he in photos with a heavyweight in the Genovese crime family? Maybe they were just friends like Tony Soprano and Artie Bucco. Now, um, I do want to talk about the last 10 years of Federici's life. Really, over the last 10 years, he's been involved really with relative anonymity. The feds will paint this ridiculous picture that he's a consigliere and he was this high-ranking member, but there's really no proof of that. In fact, I don't believe it one bit. Um, there was a bizarre situation, though, that would come up with Federici and this individual, um, uh, Hamlet Peralta. Now, Mr. Peralta, seen here, uh, was actually involved as a Ponzi schemer. He would be involved in a $12 million fraud, um, you know, involved, you know, the NYPD and all sorts of people involving a restaurant that he was looking to own. He would actually be heard in wiretaps uh talking to Anthony Federici on a consistent basis. At one point, uh, Mr. Peralta would contact uh, him at the restaurant, uh, basically asking for him. At one point in 2015, he would be identified on the restaurant phone with Tony Federici. Uh, and during the first call, an affidavit would be filed to say that Peralta told Federici that he had a $40,000 certified check for him right now. I'm sending my guy to you with the check. And he would also lament in another conversation, Peralta, that he was on actually going to send him sixty thousand, um, in reference to the fact that someone named Sammy is going to kill me. In reference to an individual called Sammy Tasomis. Now Tasomis is a associate of Federici. So basically, what goes on here is. Mr. Peralta went to Federici for $100,000 to open a club in the Bronx. No strings attached. He was just hoping he'd get the money, and it was like a bridge loan. He would pay it back in two weeks. No VIG, no illegal entity here, nothing. Federici agreed, gave him $100,000. Now, Federici would begin to ask for his money back. Mr. Peralta uh, would not eventually send the money. Peralta would insist the money is coming in either tonight or tomorrow, to which the associate Tomas would respond that money wasn't the issue. Federici was very upset because Peralta was not returning calls. Peralta would also say that he would compensate Federici for dodging him and later mentioned that he would give him 10 bottles of Remy Martin Louis XIII cognac, which sells for $3,000 a bottle, which basically is about 30 k now, again, he would contact Federici at one point um, where he would mention to Somas uh, and that he would pay him back. Federici would decline a comment saying, quote, I don't know anything about that. I know if you want a sandwich, I'll give you a sandwich before muttering an expletive and leaving his restaurant. Um, ultimately, what I would find out is that 
Anthony Federici never got his hundred thousand dollars back, and Hamler Peralta would go to prison uh, for his behavior. At one point, uh, someone who knew both Federici uh, and Hamlet Peralta would say, "Quote: Hamlet Peralta is a sweet talker. Everyone got a little bamboozled there." Does that strike you as a gangster? If that was Romanello, he would beat the fuck out of Hamlet Peralta. We all know that. If that was John Gotti, he would beat the fuck out of Hamlet Peralta. You know what I'm saying? Like, to me, in closing here, um, this is a restaurant owner. Do I think he had connections to the Genovese crime family? Yes. Do I think he probably made money from Anthony Romanello? Probably. Um, do I think he was a mover and shaker in the day-to-day runnings of the Genovese crime family? No. And in fact, if anybody from his family watches this, I want this to be made clear. Um, I have a really hard time occasionally with doing these kind of things because the federal government will paint Mr. Federici as a reputed mobster. Do I think he was a made man? I don't know. Maybe in his younger years, he made the decision to go into the mafia. Do I think in the last 20 or 30 years of his life, is he associated with mob activity? No, I don't. Not really. And in fact, from all I know about his restaurant, it was incredibly well done. People raved about it. People loved it. And the food was really good. And I think it gives a certain level of authenticity to the restaurant, quite frankly. If I lived in Corona, Queens, I would eat here every other night. And I would eat here over other places because the guy that owns it might actually be a gangster. That's pretty cool to a lot of people, whether we want to agree with that or not. Um, unfortunately, on November 9th, 2022, Anthony Federici would pass away at the age of 82 after complications from leukemia. In the same article that I mentioned earlier from Vice, Anthony Federici would say something very interesting about his involvement with the mafia or alleged involvement. He would say, quote, you throw a drunk guy to the restaurant one time and people think you're a tough guy, but who cares? Rumors are rumors and stories are stories. Let them talk. He would also end the conversation with, quote, Believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. With a smile, what you'll see in Corona, Queens at the Parkside is one of the best and most authentic Italian restaurants in New York. I'll end it with this. Anthony Federici, regardless of his connection to organized crime, maybe was a gangster. I don't really know. In the end, was he probably made, I would think? Did he know people? Absolutely. Do I think he was a violent individual, a depraved individual, a harrowing individual? No, I do not. I think in the end, we should remember him for the terrific restaurant he had, the terrific food he cooked, and the many nights that he likely kept the people of Corona, Queens, in happiness. Let's stop regarding him as a gangster. This is just one gangster that I'm really not running to exploit. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please make sure you hit the like button. We'll see you next week. Here on.